Good afternoon, Jordan Claire Robbins. Welcome on VH Berries. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Grateful is how I am feeling right now. How are you doing today in the heart of the Northern Atlantic Ocean? <laughs> I'm good. Uh, I am in Bermuda. I went for afternoon tea with my family today. It's very windy outside. <laughs> I feel like I'm in the middle of nowhere, which is how I like it. <laughs> I assume that we are both in the middle of nowhere because I am trying to escape the field, <laughs> but not the one you're thinking about, Jordan Claire Robbins. The football field because there is a final this Sunday, which is very intense to watch. Ah, and where you are, there's football, or are you referring to the NFL? I don't know anything about football, I will be the first to admit. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. There is uh, the World Cup right now. Oh, I thought you meant American football. Yes, I am well aware. We were watching the World Cup earlier today as well, so that I do know. <laughs> DC is going to be a super challenge. Same greatness as on Super Channel, um, where resides Escape the Field. Can you tell us a little bit more about this piece of art? Absolutely. Um, well, Escape the Field came along at a very interesting moment, which was in the middle of 2020, and everyone was isolating and I was with my husband, um, my, my then my then fiance at my parents' house in the mountains. And, you know, everything was kind of shut down. And so um, to get a call about this movie felt very unexpected. Um, and then suddenly I was whisked away to rural Ontario and we were running around a field for a month. It was so much fun. Um, our director, Emerson Moore, is just like, he's right in there in the trenches with you. He made it such a such a fun experience, such an immersive experience. Um, and honestly, the cast, we just we just really hit it off. It felt like we were family. Um, a part of that, I think, was due to having the time to do rehearsals. And we were all staying at the same hotel, which also was in the middle of nowhere. Um, and so we would have movie nights. We would watch horror films together. And, you know, we would rehearse. And we'd take the time to talk to Emerson about our characters, about the scenes. And it really just felt like, a, a very intense, very fun, challenging adventure. And uh, for me, it was definitely the most physically demanding role that I've ever done. Uh, I really was <laughs> out there in the field. I mean, there were nights at, you know, four in the morning and I'm wearing these scrubs and I'm freezing and you can hear coyotes howling and you can see your breath. And the corn was pretty, it was a real corn field. So it was pretty terrifying. Like it was not hard to imagine what it would be, what it would feel like to be in the middle of a cornfield. But basically the film is about six strangers who wake up in the middle of an endless cornfield. They don't know how they got there. They have no recollection of what happened between their last memory and this moment. And not only do they have to figure out how to get out, but they also have to figure out how to survive something that's hunting them. So psychological thriller, very um, character driven. I had a blast. The rest of the cast uh, are just super talented, super fun humans to be around. So I will forever look back on that movie and that film, um, that filming experience as one of the best experiences of my life. No joke, <laughs> Jordan Claire Robbins, this was a real corn uh, field. And when I'm listening to your voice, Jordan Claire Robbins, I can feel that you had a lot of fun <laughs> on the recording set, which is in terms of feeling at the complete opposite of the story that are facing the characters. Because if I understood correctly, they are in the middle of an experiment, a political experiment. Yes, I mean, that's, it's the big question throughout the film of, 
is this just a random act of some of a madman who's doing this for fun or is this something much deeper and in my opinion much scarier which is that it is very high up government funded a uh, social human experiment you know that is a very compelling question it is something that's suggested <laughs> in the film and at the end of the film it kind of leaves you hanging leaves you wondering and i know the intention of of emerson was to do a couple more films and sort of lean harder into that government sort of jason bourne esque kind of um plot Absolutely, Jordan Claire Robbins. And concerning uh, those corn film, corn fields, not only they are, uh, they seem to be infinite, but also <laughs> they are much more complex because uh, they are a, a system of map, but also of maze. Yes, yes. Well, that's what I think is so fun is. I love solving mysteries. I don't know if you've ever done an escape room, but I love escape rooms. <laughs> I did one recently with a group of friends and we did not complete it and we were so upset. We wanted to go right back in. It is so much fun. It's so satisfying to use our brains. We don't use our brains as much as you know humans used to because we have our little phones that we carry around that has all the answers we need. So the idea of waking up with no phone, having to follow clues, work with people, people that you don't know if you can trust is so cool to me because you literally have to solve the mystery in order to survive. So yes, there are little breadcrumbs that the characters have to follow to try and survive. The JC Air deserves a total refund for that game that uh, wasn't complete. <laughs> I <And> know. If... <laughs> <laughs> That's what and I think. From what I saw, uh, from the pictures that, that were taken on set, you had um, a lot of lights that were uh, over the recording set to brighten uh, everything. I assume that uh, there is a huge electricity bill. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I'm not the one paying it. Yeah, no, there were a lot of lights needed. <laughs> and to come back on the more um, fictional part with the storyline, uh, Jordan Claire Robbins, um, I'm wondering if your character has succeeded to escape because not to reveal all the stories, but we yeah. can see some mystical characters tank, taking you out at the end. And maybe that um, your character would have the chance to explain everything uh, to Sedona Mackenzie, the child <laughs> of Ryan. Maybe. I know. That's a really sad and beautiful thought. Um, yeah, I like, I mean, it, it really leaves you um, hanging and wondering what's going to happen next. And Sam, my character, is very much the heart of the story and very much sort of the eyes of the audience. And um, yeah, the movie starts when I open my eyes and ends when I close my eyes, not to give it away, but it definitely, you know, leads you to believe that Sam possesses the qualities that were needed to be able to succeed in this experiment and you don't really know if she's the only one or not but either way you get the feeling that there is a lot more to come in definitive jordan claire robbins it was a very physical um weeks and months of recording can you tell uh, me more about the the preparation uh, behind it, maybe the physical one as well as everything around your character. For sure. I mean, I had a couple stunts that, um, you know, required choreogra choreography um, in terms of fight scenes and survival type scenes. <laughs> um, one of them in particular, I remember being told, do not dig your hands 
into the ground, you will break your nails. And I'm all like, you know, I'm going to be an actor and I'm going to do it anyway. And uh, sure enough, my hands were a bloody mess. So don't advise that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I got to do, I got to do the stunt training, which is really fun. There's another um, moment where we had to use a crane where I almost fall into a trap, which was really fun where Shane West kind of plucks me out. Um, so those were awesome. I mean, other than that, like we just would always work out in the gym together because it was so physical and, you know, um, I'm very much all or nothing. And so I think for me, it would have been very hard to um, show up and be my best physically speaking and energy speaking if I wasn't also using my spare time to be staying fit and in the gym and, and staying active. So yeah, we would have our, our workouts together and I put a lot of thought into, you know, um, Sam's growth throughout this experience. I think she becomes a lot more primal, a lot more fierce, a lot less fearful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot less fearful. So, yeah, I mean, I really saw it as as her becoming. She's very cerebral, very in her head at the start of the film. I mean, she's a, a trauma surgeon. She lives life um, in such a way to minimize risk. And as the as the film goes on, she just she's very in her body. That's survival. So, um, yeah, I think even for me, I felt like I was I was pretty fit by the end of it. And then I went back to uh, to not doing that, and I didn't feel fit after that wrapped. So. <laughs> Furthermore, your character, Sam, took what I can call called a one-way trip to a bloody mess. And if I understood correctly, this might be only the beginning because, um, of course, the movie ends when your eyes are closed. But in the ending credits, we can see that this story is repeating itself. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Yes, exactly. And that raises the question, <laughs> how long has this been going on for? You know, are we the hundredth group? Are we the fifth group? So, yeah, it definitely, I would say, leaves more questions than it gives answers. Through this future film, um, the story is always building momentum. And I believe that at least 5% of the worldwide internet bandwidth should be dedicated uh, to watching this 89 minutes feature <laughs> films. In definitive, this is the equivalent of 100 28,160 frames that only tells one story. Wow, thank you. That's so cool. The, the film nerd in me really liked that math. <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> That's really cool. I truly believe, Jordan Claire Robbins, that this story, that is a loop, has inspired you and given you a lot of ideas for your personal trees. And I would love to discuss about the work that you are doing in the writing field. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Because this is going to be the next chapter of your journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um well, it's funny because when I was younger, when I was like a little kid, I actually really wanted to be an author. I loved writing stories. I loved storytelling in every sense of the word. I would just make everybody around me listen to me sing, watch me act, read my my, my books that I wrote. And so, you know, then I discovered um, being on stage and was always really into music. And and I really fell in love with that. And, and I think I kind of lost my love for writing because... Um, I'm such a perfectionist and I became very obsessed with getting good grades, being the top of my class. And so writing was sort of a vehicle for that. And um, and there were quite a few years there where I, I sort of just, you know, lost the passion for just the art of the creating in and of itself. Um, and then I got really, you know, into acting and, and being on screen. And um, I always was curious about going back to writing. And obviously as an actor, um, one of the challenges is how little control we have. Um, we, you know, essentially are, are preparing and waiting for the right opportunities to line up. And, um, and I just sort of got tired of that feeling of waiting. I wanted to take some of the power back. And, and I had a couple friends who came into my life around that time 
or who were ready in my life, but approached me who I'd been wanting to work with for a while. And it just sort of lined up over the past year that um, with those two different friends, we started to develop ideas for a pilot and I've just been working nonstop for the past, you know, 11 months plus. And so in the new year, we're hoping to kind of take it out, start pitching it, sort of figure out where the right fit is. Um, but what I will say is they're both sort of in the comedy sphere. I really love comedy. I don't feel like there is enough good comedy out there. And I think I'm not alone <laughs> when I say that. I mean, I think there, I have so many friends that are very good at comedy who love it. And, and it's just, you know, few and far between. Um, so I am personally excited to be able to create more of that. And, and not just, you know, one, one of them is sort of ensemble comedy in the vein of, Shit's Creek, Community, The Good Place. Like, I love that kind of comedy, that very character-driven, quirky comedy, Parks and Rec. Um, and the other one's sort of in the vein of, like, Fleabag, Killing Eve, um, you know, very female-driven, uh, daring, unafraid. That's the kind of stuff that excites me. So, basically, I'm just really excited um, in 2023 to just take it as it comes. I'm excited to be you know, producing, acting, writing, one day directing, um, it all really excites me. And so I think I used to be very one track mind and this is how I wanted it to go. And now I'm learning to really just surrender more and to trust that, you know, it's all coming at the right time and I'm not in the driver's seat and to just enjoy it. And, and I do love every aspect of the creative process. So I am excited to learn more. You are excited to learn more, Jordan Claire Robbins. And by taking the power back, it also means to take the electricity bill again back, <laughs> which means that maybe that some of your comedies are going to be lightened by some uh, very biologic candles. <laughs> You never know, you know, I have, I, I don't really know much about the, the lighting, the lighting world. I'm going to leave that to the people who have far more experience than I do and they can figure that out. <laughs> You're going to delegate those tasks and how would you describe um, the Robins or uh, what I can call uh, the JCR writing style? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I still feel like I'm finding it. I mean, I think it also really varies depending on the project. Um, I think the really the main the main thing driving my creativity is wanting to write truth and write fully dimensional, flawed characters. Um, you know, I think in in both cases of what I've been working on, uh, we've really worked to develop the characters before doing anything else, uh, because in my opinion, that's what makes really compelling TV, really compelling film, uh, is, is diving deep into the humanness of it and the, the, the imperfections of it. So um, that's the stuff that excites me, which is, you know, the irony doesn't escape me that I've always struggled to overcome perfectionism. So I think that through writing imperfect characters and being really unafraid and really brave with the stuff that we tackle and really tackling important themes and topics. I think that I'm just sort of like releasing all the, the need to, to write a certain way. And it's more about just serving the stories that are coming through. Um, yeah, really serving, serving the, the messages and how they'll be received. So I'm still, I'm still learning what my style is though. I would say, um, I just like to get into a flow and, uh, and, and kind of, get out of my own way, really. Absolutely. And Jordan Claire Robbins, when you're in the process of creating what you call um, the fully dimensional characters, they need to be placed in a fully dimensional environment. It makes a lot of sense, which leads me to one of your involvement concerning the ocean, because this is directly linked with the place you are currently uh, living in, which is Bermuda, a little island surrounded by the ocean. Can you tell us a little bit more about this fight that you took very close to your heart? 
Yes. Well, I, like you said, I grew up in a very small island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. So I, <laughs> I mean, it, you know, I, I just feel very, very blessed because if I didn't fall in love with the ocean, I think that would mean something was very wrong with me. Um, but yeah, Br Bermuda is, it's such a special place. And I grew up just obsessed with sharks, whales, the ocean, shipwrecks, everything to do with the sea was like my great love. I, like, you know, a million people that I meet wanted to be a marine biologist for a time and then a marine archaeologist and eventually kind of ended up segueing obviously into performing arts. But I just have always known that I wanted to orient myself so that I am able to continue to be close to the ocean. And that sort of became um, a real passion for doing what I can to um, help protect the ocean and help make the ocean as healthy as it can be. Obviously, we're at a major turning point for our planet, and things don't look good in a lot of ways. And um, and it can be very easy, I think, I find, to feel hopeless, to feel powerless, to just feel really heartbroken when we see the effects that humans are having on our planet. Um, and so in the wake of that, um, I discovered uh, Paul Nicklin and Christina Mittermeier, who are two extremely talented, passionate nature photographers, um, videographers, worked with National Geographic, you know, their work was widely known, and they, they formed an organization called Sea Legacy, which is essentially an, a, a really amazing organization that uses visual storytelling to amplify these very powerful campaigns. They travel the world. They dedicate their their whole lives to um, teaching all of us through social media what's going on, what we can do, what what needs our attention, what needs um, our passion, our money, our our thought. You know. Um, and I think that's really huge and really spoke to me um, because, like I said, apathy is is very easy. It's very easy to just turn off and feel like we can't do anything. I'm just one person. You know, what's the point? And, uh, and I really see them making change through their campaigns, through their petitions, through their um, highlighting topics and issues that I wouldn't be aware of if not for them. Um, and really, I'm just very grateful to them for... Um, giving me something to use my platform for um, and, and, and use it for good. And that's really important to me. I see the platform that I do have um, as, as a responsibility and as a privilege. And, uh, and, you know, like I said, the ocean is hugely important to me and it should be important to all of us because without the ocean, like we don't have a home, we don't have a planet and, and we receive so much from the ocean. So I think, you know, the time is now I see, you know, issues such as uh, single-use plastics and, um, you know, banning the use of drift nets and um, saving sharks from extinction. I mean, that's just a few uh, a few of many, you know, reaching um, 30 by 30, protecting 30% of the ocean by, 20, by uh, 2030. So there's a lot of really encouraging, really exciting things they're doing. And, uh, and I'm very, very, very grateful to be able to be an ambassador for them and just excited to see what they're going to continue to do for our planet. You are orienting yourself to uh, see legacy. See legacy spoke to you, and I completely agree. Uh, Jordan, Claire, uh, Robbins. Without clean water, there is no healthy and clean cornfield, which means not a very bright future for Sedona Mackenzie. <laughs> We should never forget about her. You're absolutely right. And Sedona Mackenzie is just <laughs> one of many of the young kids of our future who need a healthier planet. So yes, you are, you're right. <laughs> and Jordan uh, Claire Robbins uh, growing up in Bermuda, in, uh, as I just uh, mentioned, the Northern Atlantic Ocean. How would you uh, describe the current um, states of uh, those uh, territorial uh, waters? How is the ocean going around uh, Bermuda? Well, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious here as well as the rest of the world, the, you know, the effects of, of global warming and um, climate change, uh, you know, just even looking at the, 
the hurricane season we've had this past year and how many hurricanes we had and how early we had hurricanes and the frequency. So, um, you know, uh, we're fortunate because Bermuda is a very strong, well-built, sturdy island. We're prepared for that. Obviously, there's a lot of communities that have been really decimated um, along the East Coast by hurricanes this year. So we're very fortunate here. And, and you know, it's just a real example of why we need to be doing this work to protect uh, our planet and to reverse the effects of, of climate change. Um, I mean, you know, Bermuda's a, a tiny, tiny island in the middle of a huge expanse of ocean. You probably have heard of the uh, the Bermuda Triangle, which essentially is just a massive, you know, <laughs> portion of the ocean with Bermuda being one of the points. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can definitely see the effects of, you can see the effects of climate change here on a smaller scale and, um, you know, the seagrass beds diminishing and, um, you know, that there's, there's a lot of, a lot of the effects, even lionfish is a, uh, it's, it's a fish that it's not supposed to be in our waters that was introduced to uh, the Atlantic Ocean through pets being released into the water and they got carried through the Gulf Stream. And now it's a huge issue around Bermuda because they don't have a predator. So, you know, they're decimating prey populations that shouldn't be decimated by them. And so they're encouraging a lot of um, spear fishers to go out and, and fix this. And, and you know, a, a lot of people are, but um, it's just really interesting. Bermuda is a very, it's a very interesting place because it's so, so, so small with such a small community, but everybody here is very passionate about protecting it and passionate about the ocean. And really, you know, the the, um, the geographical location of Bermuda is just really fascinating when you consider that we're so close to the States, but we're a British colony, but we're often considered part of the Car Caribbean just because of, you know, how tropical we are and um, a lot of misconceptions. And it, it is a very small community, but um, we're very, very, very respectful of the ocean and uh, and really, it just consists of a lot of people who um, who who have a lot of love for the ocean and and do treat it with with the care and respect and want to see it thrive. Bermuda, um, Jordan, Claire Robbins is losing some uh, sea life uh, because of uh, those uh, consequences. But I also saw that uh, Bermuda is also losing population since a few years and is projected uh, over the last, the, the next uh, 50 and 100 year um, to see a, a massive uh, population decreases. Well, I did not know, I did not know that. <laughs> so once again, you were <laughs> teaching me things about, you know, uh, my own home. Victor, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, Bermuda is a really fascinating place because because of how small we are and where we're positioned, there's a lot of people coming and going and, you know, a lot of people will come down here to work. Uh, there's a, a huge population of uh, Canadians and Brits and, and you know, Americans. <laughs> and, and I grew up with um, a lot of friends coming and going, you know. I think that's what's so cool about Bermuda is that it really is a melting pot. It really attracts people who love to travel. And I was born here. I grew up here. My parents were born here. Um, but it's filled with a lot of people who are passing through. So um, I guess that doesn't totally surprise me because that, that ebb and flow that comes with a, a place like this. But that's an interesting fact that I will be sharing at the dinner table tonight. So thank you. <laughs> A very interesting fact that you will be sharing at the dinner table, Jordan Claire Robbins. And can you tell us a little bit more about the room you are in? Because there is so much history linked with your childhood and uh, the years you, you've spent here uh, at the very beginning of your journey. And also, uh, I sense that this place and this room has been built two centuries ago. It might not be really true, but I am trying <laughs> to help you and increase the real estate value. Thank of you. That place. Yes, it's a thousand years old. <laughs> no, it's well, it's not. It's it's <laughs> you're not totally wrong. I mean, this is the house I grew up in. Um, well, I I think we moved here when I was about one and a half, two years old. So I wasn't born in this house, but this house is uh, coming up on a hundred years old, maybe eighty years old. So it's a beautiful house, not on the market, but. Um, 
I grew up in this house, uh, and that is very cool to me. And it's 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 something that I have realized is not necessarily as common as I thought it was. My husband grew up in like five or six houses. I mean, you know, I think it's pretty common for people to move growing up and and uh we we didn't like um I I've been here since I was a baby so it's very nostalgic when I get to return home and be in you know my childhood bedroom and um play with my dogs and in the backyard that I grew up playing in as a kid and it's really special to me and especially with my career meaning I travel so much and I've been based in Canada for quite a while now. Um, so yeah, for, for me, it's, it's a really special thing that I get to be able to, um, come back in between projects and be somewhere that feels so familiar and so like home and so nostalgic. And I think that's really important to have, um, at the root of, of having such a career that I'm so passionate about it, coming home and recharging and being somewhere that really feels like, um, it's connected and rooted in where I came from and my origin story and, and why I wanted to create and become an actor to begin with. Recharging the batteries, Jordan Claire Robbins. The electricity bill is definitely hunting you. <laughs> and you just mentioned Canada, which is what uh, a place that you can call a home because you moved, you moved there um, a few years uh, after uh, arriving on Earth, and you are, this is actually the place where you uh, got that theater and psychology degree. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, this uh, secret aspect of uh, your uh, specific journey? Yeah, um, I don't know how secret it is, <laughs> but I'll tell you. Um, so I went to high school in Bermuda. I stayed right till the end of my uh, schooling. And then when I graduated, I knew that I wanted to pursue acting. I knew that I loved being on stage, but I also was very fascinated by psychology, which really is, you know, the same as as acting. It's just why we do what we do and the, the, the humanity and relationships and understanding what makes us who we are. So um, I did a double major. I moved to Toronto, went to University of Toronto out of high school. So I was 18. And then I got my double major psychology and drama there. And um, while I was in Toronto doing this, I did a bit of modeling, which was really great experience um, being in front of the camera, meeting a lot of people, um, just getting myself out there in a new city. And, uh, and then, yeah, when I graduated, I uh, made a couple friends who steered me in the direction of some great on-screen acting classes because I came to realize that my theater training, you know, didn't cover all of the technical skills needed to be on <laughs> set. It's a very, very different, a lot of crossover, but still very different skill sets in many ways. And did a bunch of classes and, uh, and yeah, eventually got um, a, an agent for acting uh, separate from my modeling agency, booked a couple little jobs, Man Seeking Woman. 12 monkeys and you know the was bitten by the bug and became absolutely obsessed with being on set with the collaborative process of filmmaking of you know shooting tv I just couldn't get enough of it and uh and yeah and then after about eight years there I decided to switch it up went out to the west coast to Vancouver which is where I'm based now um but as you probably know the Umbrella Academy shoots in Toronto, so about 11 months into living in Vancouver, I booked that, and of course, it took me right back to Toronto. So Toronto is a huge, hugely special place in my heart, and it's um, a city I'm very familiar with. I have a lot of love for it, very comfortable there. It's always very fun to go back, a lot of great friends, a lot of great memories, and, and I love Vancouver. And then, you know, come back to Bermuda as much as I can and everywhere in between. So yeah, I really, I do really love Canada. It's, it's got a special place in my heart screen and stages um, made, made you beaten by the bugs <laughs> and I am very grateful to be tonight part of the topic of society at the dinner table. Thank you, Jordan Claire Robbins. For being the topic of my dinner 
table tonight. Thank, thank you. <laughs> About the decreases of the population, I yes. was specifically mentioning that. Yes, I am very appreciative of that. You know, I feel like it, <laughs> I'm running out of interesting things to share with my family. So it's good to have that in your back pocket so that you continue to impress the people around you. 